All right, the recording is on. Uh, welcome back, everybody, to uh, the second lecture on DC 310. We're talking about culture, culture in the organization, culture in the congregation, how do we keep it aligned, how do we nurture the right kind of culture, so on. And uh, towards the end of the last lecture, we just looked at the contrast uh, between um, behaviors of, uh, you know, that, that give rise to a healthy culture among leaders and among those who are the staff versus behaviors that would create a toxic culture, a very unhealthy culture uh, among the leaders or among the staff. And, of course, it will hurt his people, it hurt others. Right? So, if you look at it, uh, I mean, if you want to put this in a little box like this, uh, you can see uh, various kinds of uh, uh, elements in, in the culture. People, if you say, you know, when it comes to decision making, is it top down or is it participatory? So people can say they'll respond. Uh, is it rigid? Is the uh, environment very rigid? Is it very relaxed? Is it cold versus do people, people feel cared for? Is it disjointed or is it integrated? Like are people are all doing their own things or you know, we're all feeling like one part, part of a, a big bigger whole. Uh, is the culture very focused on numbers or is it focused on quality? Is it hierarchical or is it flat? Is it micromanaged or is there uh, people are free, uh, autonomous, people are free to make decisions? Is it reactive or proactive? Is it secretive or honest? Um, uh, is it relationship saving or the truth telling? Are people compromising the truth just to keep relationships or is there a good healthy balance there? People are willing to tell the truth. Uh, is it indifferent or curious? Is it trust creating versus trust destroying? So these are just few, and these are not necessarily everything, but you know, we can say, hey, you know, when you when you want to talk about organization culture, you're looking at all of these things. What is the current scenario within the organization? So that's some, something to think about. Now, uh, Jim Collins, uh, he's not a this is not a Christian. Book, but more of a management, uh, you know, book. Uh, he's, he's written several books, but in his uh, book on book called Good to Grey, uh, he talks about characteristics uh, that help organizations move from being just good organizations to being great organizations. And then he listed these things. But the reason I put it here is you see that so many of these things are. You know, they align to what we would call as a biblical value. Now, this is a general management book. It's, it's not a Bible book, but it's a management book. But if you look at uh, the characteristics he's listed that help organizations move from being good to being great organizations, you find, you know, so much of parallel with um, what we would or biblical values. Uh, and we'll just go through some of these things. So he talks about having curiosity, that is being willing to learn, willing, willing to explore, being looking at new ideas, being curious, uh, being rigorous, not ruthless. That means you know you're working hard, but you're not uh, uncaring, cold, harsh towards people. There's a culture of discipline. It's very interesting, discipline. Yeah, you you have a disciplined people. You have disciplined thinking, disciplined acting. So people are very disciplined. They are focused. They are working in a very disciplined way. Uh, he says about leadership humility. Now it's very much like what we learn from the scriptures. The leaders have to be servants. He talks about professional determination. And the Bible talks about you know us being diligent, us being uh, you know pressing through. Enduring, endurance, uh, right people in the right jobs, unwavering faith, 
uh, just belief that, you know, of course, they are speaking from a general management perspective. For us, we have faith in God, faith in what He can do for us, honesty about the facts and the current reality, uh, making use of technology, uh, having core values, staying, staying by core values, which we've just spoken about, uh, understanding what differentiates us, what are we good at, and doing that well. Uh, and of course, then there are other thought, other things like economic, like also financial aspects, having passion on what we, on what we're doing and focusing on it, uh, being goal based uh, rather than just rubber rubber doll, just you know, just doing out of zeal and excitement, and, uh, and making decisions that are based on dialogue, that is conversation, and then also analyzing reflecting on uh, on the decisions. So it's very interesting that these are things that um, uh, are put out by general management uh, leaders. And a lot of it is applicable for Christian context, church organizations, uh, and so on. So uh, think about these things. You know, making an organization go from good, being a good organization, to being a great organization these are some of the things that they have shared based on their uh, research and study and so on. So what I want to, you know, to uh, bring our attention to is uh, it is good to evaluate the culture of our organization from time to time. And, you know, it's actually a very scary thing uh, because even I try to think, okay, how are we I say B and about APC. What we are, how are we doing as an organization culturally? In a, in a, uh, how's the culture of our organization? And, and, and uh, if people, the people who are working in the organization, have to express and say, "Hey, this is how I am feeling working here," what would they say? You know. It's actually very scary. <laughs> Will they say that, yeah, I'm really happy? Will they say, I'm actually enjoying my work? Or will they say, like, oh, I'm feeling very uh, controlled, I'm feeling very, uh, I don't have freedom, or uh, I've been, I'm making, I have to work very hard, or whatever, or I'm not being rewarded, or I'm not being appreciated, or something. So, uh, I, I think about it and I try to, you know, just listen to how people are feeling, talking, sensing, sensing how they're feeling and so on. Try to improve it. And now, you know, while of course we have to keep the work going, but at the same time, we have to feel the pulse. You know, feel what is the culture of the organization. Get an understanding. So generally, how do we do it? How can we, you know? How can we get an understanding of where are we, where's the organizational culture at? One is, uh, we can ask ourselves these questions. And what are the experiences, what people remember about the organization? So especially those who've been there for several years, are they able to talk about the stories, the journey that we've made? Can they look back and say, hey, we went through this. Now, you know, for many of us, um, COVID, the last two years, 2020 to 2022, was the thing. But if people, those who have journeyed in the organization through that, when they look back, what would their memories be? What would the stories be uh, about how we as an organization went through that? You know, what other things will they, will they remember? And what are the stories they would say, you know, about that time? Will they say that, yeah, you know, God did some amazing things uh, during those two years uh, and so on? Will they remember, you know, some really powerful stories? Uh, so things like that. And for those who've been, of course, with the organization longer than that, you know, what were the stories they remember uh, uh, about their journey with the organization? That's one way to assess Secondly, what would they say about leadership? You know, so if you ask just anybody in the organization, hey, what do you say about the leadership at 
your organization. What are the outstanding traits? What would they highlight? You know, will they say, well, he's very, very controlling, he's manipulative, he's not open, you know, or he or she is not open, he or she is not there. What, what would they say? And that gives us a feeling of if you ask the people there, you know, uh, ask the people who are working in the organization, ask them what will they say. Similarly, what are the third one? What are the practices that people are excited about? Hey, what do we normally do? What are you excited about? I say, hey, we never did anything. We only worked. <laughs> that means you know. There's, that means there are no rituals that are creating memories that are affecting the behavior and thinking of people. But if they say, hey, you know, every, every month we had great food. <laughs> Uh, whenever there was a, you know, we celebrated birthdays, uh, we celebrated people's, you know, special days. Uh, we uh, went on a picnic at least once a year as a, as a as a group, or we had, you know, nice Christmas, whatever things like that. So those are practices which we feel excited about. Those are the things that are creating memories that are affecting thinking and behavior and so on. So we think about that. Uh, so we can ask the same questions about the church staff. We can also ask these same questions about the congregation, right? What will the congregation remember, the people in the congregation remember? Then another question we can ask is, hey, how do people behave in this organization? How about people here? Are they friendly? Are they supportive? Uh, are they open to giving feedback and receiving feedback? Or are people all closed, each one just quietly does their work and goes away, they don't talk much and, you know, very cold, uncaring. What is, what, what do you feel? How do people feel about the organization? So it, it, we're talking about feeling, not thinking. Why? Because when you're thinking, we tend to think like, oh, I'm supposed to say this. And you ask oh, how you're feeling, then it's more, this is how I really feel, right? And that can reflect what's actually happening in the organization. So feeling is like a, a, a sensing of the temperature, what's really happening, and it gives it more direct expression of the culture as opposed to what people know they think, right? They, when they're thinking, they know what to say is right and wrong and all that. So how do you feel? Um, are people inward looking or to focus? Is it all about us and what we do, or is it about the people we are serving? Uh, are people risk takers? Can they innovate or are they totally averse to risk? Is the organization hierarchical or is it flat? So these are just general questions to do a general assessment of the culture. And um, uh, it's, it's, it's nice to uh, think about these things, talk to people about it. And then, you know, maybe even have like some way by which people can express this, maybe in an anonymous survey, uh, maybe in uh, just I mean, somebody like, like usually like an HR person or somebody from outside who's talking to the people and saying, hey, what's going on? How do you feel? Uh, so they really assess what is going on. Like if I, as a leader, go and ask people. Mostly, they'll all tell me the nice things. They know that I, you know, they they may think I'm only here. But if somebody else is doing it, they just tend to be more open, more free, and just say what, what they feel. They, they, they what they're really feeling about the organization. So you could do it as a questionnaire. This is just an example, and let people uh, evaluate this uh, in, a, in a very uh, objective way, or you can do it in, a, in, a, in an anonymous way, and you can then evaluate how things are. So doing a questionnaire or feedback or a survey uh, with questions can help. Uh, now, when we're talking about church, uh, our goal is to nurture kingdom culture. Now, we have a big plus or a big positive. That is, 
uh, as a Christian church or a Christian organization, uh, we, we, we are at an ad advantage because all of us working here are coming to the same uh, perspective. We want to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And, our, and that's how all of us are coming with that mindset, you know, kingdom touch. So what would that look like? Well, these are the expressions of kingdom culture. It's compassion, it's faith, humility, sacrifice, generosity, hard work, perseverance, creativity, stewardship, unity, integrity, exalting Jesus. I mean, these are some things we can put on. These all are expressions of the culture of God's kingdom. Right? And we can... We see this in scripture. So therefore, as a Christian church or a Christian organization, these things we should we should really be nurturing exp these expressions in our culture. So the moment you know somebody comes to work or uh, somebody comes into the congregation, they should really be, you know, they should become very evident. Yeah, they're seeing these things happen. You know, hey, these people are actually living this out. They're actually living by these things, whether in the you know in the whether the church community or whether it's the church staff, the organization. They should see this uh, expressed in our in our lives, and uh, we can nurture it by retrading the traits, modeling these traits, guiding people into this. And rewarding us. It's like we've, we've already discussed this before. But these are things that we want to uh, really nurture amongst ourselves. So, lastly, uh, how do we, what can we do to protect organization culture? So, you know, it, it, it is a lot of work to have a good culture within the organization. It doesn't happen by accident, uh, it, it's a constant, ongoing work. To maintain good, healthy kingdom culture, uh, we keep monitoring. We have to keep making corrections. We have to correct ourselves. We have to correct the people, and just maintain that. Uh, so, what are some actions that we can take to protect the culture? Because it's not easy, and you don't want it to be destroyed. One is hire the right people. Because remember, ultimately, it's people who are going to determine the culture. Okay? So. Uh, in, 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 in for, especially for the organization, you need to bring the right people in. Uh, you know, people who can fit into the kingdom culture and who will help develop kingdom culture. Right? If people are coming with, you know, the wrong mindset, or oh, I'm going to be a boss, I'm going to tell people what to do, I'm going to dominate people, control people, manipulate this that. If they're coming with those kind of preconceived behaviors or mindsets you know we shouldn't hire them we shouldn't bring them in so that's so the the, the interview process which we talked about earlier is very important uh, we must preserve good traditions if we are doing traditions like you know like celebrating birthdays or you know, uh, doing nice farewells or having some things community things and those traditions are helping us then keep it going right uh, things that you do well Keep that going. Uh, encourage communication so that people can tell us what they're feeling. And uh, if we listen to that, we will know if things are going right or going wrong. Things are going wrong, we need to address it. Uh, we need to recognize reward behavior, not just performance. Performance is good, of course, people are rewarded for performance. But even behavior, somebody did something that expressed or highlighted certain kingdom culture, recognize that, talk about it. And then people say, hey, that's a good thing. That's, that's behavior that encourages the right kind of culture. At the same time, we need to address behavior that's contrary to the organization culture, something that's out of line. We need to address that. Hold people accountable to make sure that their actions are aligned to the culture we are trying to develop. And in, if there is toxic behavior, if there's any behavior that's wrong, then 
address it. Don't cover it up. You know, so example, a simple example, a couple of, I don't know, maybe two weeks back, somebody gave me a feedback that uh, another staff in their, uh, you know, uh, in their effort to get something done uh, because of a timeline and time pressure and all that, um, they wrote a very kind of a harsh email to some other people. And it was brought to my notice that I said, hey, and then I addressed it. I said, hey, why, why was that email written? Why was it written like that? Because we want to keep, you know, our communication very positive, very healthy. Yes, we are all, you know, we may be under pressure from time to time to get certain things done, uh, but that is still not an excuse to, you know, communicate in a harsh way. So we address that. It's a small thing, but it's better to address it when it's small. And then that person knows, hey, I'm not supposed to do that. You know, I'm not supposed to be rude to others. I have to be kind. And so we, we you know, address it. Don't cover it up. Don't ignore it. Address it. Talk about it. Uh, and so so the, the, the idea here is we have, it is, it is not easy to build a good, healthy culture. Once you are doing that, you need to also protect it. Otherwise, it's very easy things to follow up okay so that brings us to the conclusion of our lesson on culture let me just pause here for a minute or to see if there are any more questions any points of discussion uh, before we move forward any questions so we've been talking about culture within the organization how important it is how to build it nurture it what are the characteristics and then how to protect the culture within the organization. Any questions? What's good? All right. Everything is the... OK. Everything is Thank so you, fast, so good, so fast. Thank you, colleagues. All right. So let me introduce our next lesson, which is on finances. And uh, I'll just introduce the topic, give, give a few thoughts. Then we will continue that next class, next week. So another very important part of church ministry is money. Obviously, because it requires money to do ministry, right? Uh, even the church needs money uh, to, to do the work, right? Uh, yes, we are doing spiritual work. We are doing spiritual ministry. But uh, just about everything costs money. If you want to rent a hall to meet, it costs money. Uh, for people to come and do work, you need to have the infrastructure. Uh, and uh, so uh, we all understand, right? It requires money to do the ministry. And so money is involved. And uh, God has, in his word, uh, he has uh, put a system in place by which people can give for the work of the ministry. So obviously, uh, God's people are giving their money to the church or the Christian ministry to do the work. They are contributing, they're giving on their own part. But now, it is our responsibility to manage this properly to make sure that we are being good stewards of the money that comes. And, uh, you know, uh, we can see examples in, you know, I mean, recent and older examples where if money is not handled properly, even good ministries or good churches can go down. If money is not managed properly, and I, I remember, you know, uh, I'm, I'm just mentioning one example. I'm sure that there are lots and lots and lots of stories and examples. But I remember back in the 
the 1990s, there was a powerful minister of God uh, in the United States. Uh, and, uh, you know, and God was using him very powerfully, uh, in the, especially in the area of prayer. So he had a, he, he, uh, he was based in, in Texas, the congregation, a big growing church, powerful. And then he was going around the US, the United States, filling up stadiums. People just coming to pray. So you can imagine, you know, he would go to various cities and uh, the stadiums would be filled. People just coming for prayer. So it was wonderful, amazing, amazing ministry. And uh, what was, uh, things were going so, so good. He had written some books on prayer. And everything was going so good. But what happened was uh, in the church, uh, in, in his church, and again, I, I don't know all the details, but this is what, uh, this is what actually started the, the breakdown. Um, people who were putting in money, of course, they would put it in envelopes, they put it in the offering box, or people would be sending money. Uh, obviously, such a big church and so much money is coming in. The pastor is not sitting and counting the money. It's people who are handling it, right? The, you have the ushers who are going and collecting the money. And then, of course, there's, there's a way on which everything is counted and packed, all of that. But what happened was, uh, and I don't know where this problem happened. I mean, who, who is responsible for this? But, um, you know, Envelopes would come, and uh, people would just take out the money. They would, there would be prayer requests. You know, people are sending money with the prayer request. Uh, just the prayer request is just thrown out. So, like, the money is taken out, but the envelope with the prayer request is just thrown into the bin. Like, nobody's even praying for it. Or there's no system, you know, how that's being handled. So. That was just one example, one one point. But like that, there were other things. I think, like you know, some. So I think basically the whole thing was not being handled properly, and the TV channel came and recorded this, and it went on television. Look, this this is what is happening when you send money, when you're putting money in the offering in this ministry, and they highlighted this, and it was so sad because almost overnight. Uh, it became, you know, it became a bad news about how much envelopes and offerings that were being sent were being handled. It went on television. It, it had such a repercussion. It impacted the pastor. It impacted the leader so much. He went into depression, and you know, just almost overnight, almost overnight, this whole ministry collapsed. Uh, his marriage broke. This marriage and everything was it was just devastating. And what triggered it was this report on how the money was not being handled properly. The offerings that were being sent, what was being put into the you know the offering boxes, it was not being handled properly. Just that thing that went out, it brought this whole ministry to a standstill. That's just one example where. Uh, when money, you know, the, the man himself was very good. So genuine man of God. God was doing some powerful things through his life and the ministry. But obviously he cannot control, you know, so much that's happening. Something was not handled properly and it, everything just collapsed. This one example. But then there are a lot of other examples where uh, Christian leaders have been responsible for misusing money, mismanaging money, or you know, doing wrong things, uh, and uh, it caused problems. You know, and I remember even Yonggi Cho, you know, Yonggi Cho, a fine man, and a pastor of the largest, world's largest church, admired by everybody. He had such a wonderful ministry, you know, till the very end. But then towards the end, 
uh, and he was very elderly at this point in time when news came out that his one of his sons were mismanaging or misused uh, again in some way funds that belonged to the church and that you know uh, and Yogichu had signed off on some documents that allowed him to do that. And that caused such a bad name you know, to a man who had lived a life so well, who had done amazing, God had used to do amazing work. But towards the end of his life, you know, these things came and uh, came to light, and it was very sad. Um, no, whether it was an unintentional mistake or, you know, I, I, we don't know the details, but, you know, Yongi Chan has gone home to be with the Lord. But it was very really sad that towards the end of his life, you know, that something like this had to come out and cause a lot of disrepute or damage to otherwise a life that was so well lived and uh, uh, many, many decades of serving God. So, I like this because you know, see many examples, and so uh, the, the, uh, we can never understate uh, or we can never overstate the importance of uh, having good finance, accounting, and budgeting, financial management when it comes to church or Christian ministry. Now, let's just mention a little bit about um, uh, key principles. How are we going to raise money? How can we, first of all, we need to have people contribute to the ministry. Um, one, here are the key principles on how we're going to raise money first. We must know that if God has given us a vision, then our responsibility is to just share the vision. Okay? And let God stir up the hearts of people to give towards the vision. Okay? We must not force people, we must not manipulate people, we must not, uh, you know, trick people into giving. Now, just share the vision. Hey, this is what we're going to do. If you feel stirred in your heart to give towards the vision, give. You know, uh, sometimes uh, churches, ministries, they do all kinds of things. So they would say, uh, before the 30th of this month, you must send $30 and, or 30 whatever. And uh, God will bless you. What uh, they, they, you cannot, un unless they're trying to force people to give, they use all kinds of tricks. And I've seen all kinds of tricks uh, churches, ministries doing, and it, it's not right. Okay? The simple thing is to share the vision. If God has given you a vision of some work to be done, to share it with people and let God move upon the hearts of people to give. And we see in the Bible that God stirs up the hearts of people. Example, when he told Moses to build the tabernacle, he said, God told Moses, Moses, I want you to build the tabernacle. All you do is tell the people to bring the offering. And let each one bring what is in their hearts. And it happened. They had more than enough to build the tabernacle. Same thing during David's time. When he felt time to make arrangements for the building of the temple, he just told the people, said, you know, God has put in my heart uh, that we should gather get these things ready to build a temple. This is what I am giving. All of you want to bring, you bring what you want. And the people respond that they brought more than what was needed. You know? So just share the vision. Don't force people. Second principle is this. If we serve people spiritually, they will sow financially. So you just focus on serving the people spiritually. And let God move upon their heart to sow financially. So serve them spiritually, then they can give financially. Uh, but without sowing into people's lives spiritually, if we expect them to sow financially, that is typically not right. right? First you sow spiritually into their lives, serve them spiritually, then God will move upon their hearts to sow financially. Second, uh, another important truth is to be a good steward. So if you're a good steward, then God himself is going to increase what you steward, how much you steward. So if, if you have be a good steward of that little, 
when God sees your faithfulness in little things, then he will trust you with more. So be a good steward of whatever God has given you. Then be accountable to the people who are given. So if we are accountable to the people, then the people can trust us. They will be more free to give. They say, yeah, when I'm giving here, uh, I know that uh, the money is being used properly. It is uh, being, it's not going to be wasted. It's going to be mismanaged. So they are more free to give. And lastly, we must also be responsible to government authorities. Uh, you know, whatever needs to be done, and we'll talk more about this. You know, whatever needs to be done uh, to be accountable to local authorities, we need to do that. Give a report of finances and so on. Okay? So these are biblical principles for us to follow when we are managing the money that is given to the church, given to the ministry, and uh, what we do. So from time to time, maybe once a year, I will send an email. Um, during the course of the year, saying, hey, these are areas where you can give. So I have to say, that's once a year. So not every Sunday, men, you know, asking people, please give, please give, please give. No, we don't do that. We just let people know, hey, these are, these are all the things the church is doing. The ministries are involved. People know. And they can freely give uh, towards what they want. And then at the end of every year, we send a report. So we do, we call it a year in review report, where we state, you know, what we have spent money on. So where is there as a ministry? So people know, okay, this is where the money has gone. Now, of course, we're not giving a report of every detail, but at a high level, these are different areas of ministries. This is where the money has gone. So people have an idea. Uh, and then also our annual audited statements are put out on our church website, right from 2001 till today. And every year's annual audited statements have been checked by the auditor, been approved. It goes up on our church website. So anybody who's interested, they can go and see, okay, this is the financial status of the church. So it's a form of being accountable to the people uh, who've given the money. So we'll get into the details of it. There's just an introduction here today to this subject. Uh, we'll get into the details, the practical side of how to manage money, how to budget, how to be able to handle this properly, how to do it. I'll just share some of the practical things we do here. Um, any questions for on, on just this introduction? Any questions so far? Okay, so we'll pause here for today. Uh, we'll pick this up next week uh, as we talk about uh, finances in the church and ministry. Okay, could somebody close in prayer, please? And then we will dismiss. Father, we thank you. We thank you for this wonderful lecture that we had this morning, Lord. We also thank you for the wisdom, the knowledge, the skills that you've given to our dear pastor so that he can inculcate into us the sense of ministry and doing the right thing in the right time and in the right place. So, Lord, as we go out of this lesson, we call upon your Holy Spirit to teach us and to guide us and not to be only hearers of the word, but also doers of the word. We do pray in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And everybody says amen. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for being part of the class. Um, see you all again next week. Enjoy your day.